911, what's the address of the emergency? I think my wife shot herself. There's blood all over. Shot herself with a gun? It looks like it. <laughs> a gut-wrenching scene plays out during the 911 call. A young boy is the first to find his mother shot to death inside their home. Does she still have the weapon? I don't know. We just got Where did home she shoot here. herself? I don't know. I just saw her in, in blood. Busy trying to console his son, Stephen Allwine has little information for the operator. Okay. Do you see her right now? No, I'm with my son. Sir, do you know if she was breathing at all? I don't. I okay, just got back from dinner. Okay, would you like to check on her and see if she is, or do you believe that no. she's beyond help? Stay there for just a second. They want me to go check on her. Hang on. Stephen quickly returns to the phone with the tragic news. Okay. She's not breathing. I, I can't tell where she shot. I don't know. By now, the nine-year-old boy has figured out his mother is dead. The gun lying near her body. Oh, why did she... I, I don't know. I don't know, bud. He wonders what will happen to him and his father. Are we going to remarry? <laughs> I don't know, bud. When you first walk in, this looks like a suicide. Yes. But a closer look reveals something sinister. A killer hell-bent on taking the life of a preacher's wife. Stephen and Amy Allwine have been married for 20 years. The couple met in college and were immediately bonded by their deep Christian faith. What's the name of the church they attended? United Church of God, I believe. They weren't just members of the church. Stephen was also a preacher. He was initially a deacon, and then he became a church elder. When you are an elder in the church, you are invited to preach, give sermons. Um, he traveled to do that. The couple each ran a business out of their home in Cottage Grove, Minnesota. Stephen, an IT specialist. Amy, a dog trainer. Anyone from the outside looking in would say what about this family? Typical American loving church going family. But on a Sunday night in November, the image of their happy family is shattered by that single gunshot. Are there any other weapons in the residence, sir? Yes, there's a shotgun in the room and uh, two rifles downstairs. Okay, is the shotgun the one she has? No, she had a handgun. Just a few hours earlier, Amy Allwine had been steaming pumpkins to make a dessert. But after lunch, Stephen says she wasn't feeling well, so she went to lie down. Around 5.30, he left her alone while he and his son had dinner. When they returned, about 90 minutes later, she was dead. Is it just you and your son home right now? Yes. Okay. Stephen, are you able to just step out of the step out of the home with your son so that my officers can see you when they pull up? Yeah. Sergeant Randy McAllister of the Cottage Grove Police Department was the first detective on the scene. You questioned the suicide theory right off the bat. Yeah, I, I, I hadn't completely discarded it yet because some weird, weird things can happen with physical evidence and, and blood splatter and, and physics, but it was enough for me to, to at least put the brakes on. What stuck out to you? She was sort of laid out with her arms out to 45 degrees. Um, it, that's not a normal position for somebody who's just shot themselves in the head. Another red flag, blood drops around the bedroom. There were some what we call satellite blood drops outside of the main blood pool itself, which suggests that there was something suspended above that area and dripping blood down. Also, the position of the gun on Amy's left side. Her family, uh, who's outside by this time, says she's right-handed. So there were three red flags immediately sticking out to you. Right. Fred Fink is the criminal division chief for Washington County, Minnesota. So at this point, is the case ruled a suicide? No, it was ruled undetermined by the medical examiner. The ruling leads to search warrants and a closer look by crime scene investigators who soon make some disturbing discoveries. Blood had been cleaned up uh, in multiple areas in the crime scene. So we know if someone's committing suicide, they're not coming back from the dead to clean up the crime scene. Correct. So there was this huge pool of wiped up blood outside of the uh, master bedroom, as well as then footprints 
down the hall, into the bathroom, into the laundry room, and back. The blood wasn't visible to the naked eye, only when detectives use a chemical known as luminol. We see that on television all the time and wonder if any of that's true, but they sprayed it with luminol, turned off the lights, and it just luminesced. Even before the blood was spotted using luminol, detectives say it was obvious someone had been doing some cleaning up in the hallway. The floor is very dirty, a lot of dog hair, but then we step onto the hallway onto the wood floor and all the way up to the master bedroom, uh, the wood floor is very clean. So at this point, the suicide theory is pretty much off the table. It's looking more and more suspicious and less and less like suicide but at this point. A Sunday night ends tragically for Stephen Allwine and his young son. The two return home for dinner to find their wife and mother shot to death. We believe that uh, the son was the first one to find Amy. Amy Allwine had been shot one time in the head. A handgun was lying next to her body. At first, Stephen believes his wife had committed suicide. I think my wife shot herself. There's blood all over. But cops quickly determined the crime scene says otherwise. So you think the killer, once he killed her, staged the crime scene, then this person went into a cleanup process? Yes. Who would want to murder the preacher's wife? By all accounts, she had no enemies. Amy was well liked at her church and by the clients of her very popular dog training business. Her friends and her customers with the dog world too loved her. They absolutely loved her. But very few of those people knew Amy she had actually been holding a terrible secret and living in grave fear for her life for six months, ever since the day the FBI showed up on her doorstep. They had come across a threat to Amy's life on the internet. In early 2016, hackers broke into a hitman for hire website known as Besa Mafia. Those hackers turned their information to the FBI, a list of people being targeted for murder by Besa Mafia. One of the names on that list, Amy Allwine. Law enforcement learned that a individual with the username Dog Day God posed the question to Besa Mafia, will you kill this person? FBI agents were certain this was no case of mistaken identity. Dog Day God had made it very clear who was to be killed. There was a series of emails back and forth between Besa Mafia and Dog Day God some of which include uh, instructions on, on where Amy was going to be going for a dog competition, the place she was staying at that location. Uploaded a picture of Amy to uh, Besa Mafia so the so-called hitman would know precisely who to, who to kill. Dog Day God also handed over plenty of money to ensure getting the job done. Dog Day God ultimately paid Besa Mafia about $12,000 in Bitcoin. Sergeant McAllister explains why bitcoins were used instead of cash. It's an electronic currency um, that's essentially anonymous. You can sell them, exchange them, and it's really, really difficult to track. So it's sort of the currency of choice on the dark web. Assistant County Attorney Jamie Cruiser says because Besa Mafia was on the dark web, the FBI had no way to identify Dog Day God. By being on the dark web, you cannot be monitored. What you are looking at, what you are typing in, what you are trying to do, buy, sell, it is unmonitored. Fortunately for Amy Allwine, the Hitman for Hire website was a fraud. Besa Mafia was taking people's money, but not carrying out any killings. They were defrauding would-be criminals, if you will. But though Besa Mafia may not have been real, the threat to Amy Allwine's life was. Amy had to be terrified. Yeah, she was absolutely terrified. Terrified and confused. Steve and Amy had no idea who would want her dead. And the only thing the FBI could tell them Whomever was Dog Day God uh, was intent on uh, having Amy Allwine killed. But identifying that person would be nearly impossible. 
That's when the all wines take drastic steps to protect themselves. So Stephen goes out and he buys a handgun. Yep. What type of gun? A nine millimeter pistol. They install an extensive security system at their home, which sits on 26 acres off a rural road. They installed some security cameras and a security system from Xfinity. They also installed one of those uh, ring video doorbells. They even left the country for a couple weeks, only telling the people who were traveling with them. They went to Germany, and it was part of their uh, church. And we did learn that Amy actually rested as well as she had rested all summer. She knew being in Germany that any potential killer probably wasn't going to be able to track her there. But when she returned home, the threats continued. This time in the form of a couple of cryptic emails. In the email, it basically said, you need to commit suicide, otherwise we're going to harm the rest of your family. Then, the reason why. Someone using the name Jane alleges Amy ruined her life by having an affair with her husband, saying, quote, I do not know how a fat expletive like you got to my husband, but because of you, he left, and my life has become expletive. Commit suicide. If you do not, then you will slowly see things taken away from you, and each time you will know that you could have stopped it, which will eat you apart from the inside. The sender even provided Amy with a list of best ways to kill herself. Shotgun to the head, cyanide, inhaling gas, slitting wrist. Also in the email were uh, identifiers, if you will. I know where your, your, your gas uh, meter is and identifying certain people and their addresses that would be harmed uh, if she didn't commit suicide. Jane even mentioned specifics about the Allwine's young son, saying, quote, I saw last Friday he was wearing a bright pink shirt and made it appear that she'd been watching Amy. I see that you moved the RV. All the emails were coming in as anonymous emails, and they were used through an email anonymizer. Um, virtually untraceable. In closing, the sender warned, unless you are a heartless, selfish expletive, then I expect to see your obituary in the paper in the next couple weeks. Are you thinking this Jane woman could be responsible for this? Um, and staging the scene? Yeah, I mean, that's part of the mix. When Amy Allwine was found shot to death inside her home in Cottage Grove, Minnesota, Everyone in the small town was stunned, especially her next door neighbors. The crime lab van was in the driveway for three days and nobody would talk to us about it and detectives would come and interview us and I would say, what, what? Gene and Lee Kocher say they couldn't get any answers from cops and suddenly felt unsafe in their own home. <laughs> like, you know, if somebody dies, you say, oh, they had a heart attack. They, you know, they wouldn't tell us anything. They just said, no, there's more going on. Cops quickly determined Amy's death wasn't a suicide like her husband first suspected. She was murdered. This was really a classic whodunit. In the months leading up to her killing, there were threats on Amy's life. Prosecutor Fred Fink says someone using the name Dog Day God paid $12,000 to a fake hitman for hire website called Face a Mafia. Do you think that they realized this website was a fraud at some point? Ultimately, after, after they paid $12,000, yes. A few months later, the preacher's wife received emails from someone using the name Jane. The email began by accusing Amy of having an affair with this sender's husband ruining her life. She was going to make sure that uh, she ruined Amy's if Amy did not kill herself. But as they dug deep to find the identity of the possible killer, Detective Randy McAllister says they couldn't find any evidence that Amy had ever cheated on her husband. You went through her phone, her emails, her social media, all of her transactions. Her computers. Uh, everything. There was zero indication she would step out on her husband or was stepping out on him. Washington County detectives believe Jane and Dog Day God are the same person. But who is it? And why did they want Amy Allwine dead so badly? I appreciate you coming in. This is a, a vexing situation. And I know it's hard for you. 
A couple days after his wife's death, Stephen Allwine meets with detectives for more than two hours. We certainly weren't zeroing in on, on Stephen. Cops just wanted to know more about the threats on Amy's life because prior to her death, the case had been handled by the FBI. When she received these emails, was there a gut feeling or somebody you attributed these to? Stephen said he had no clue who'd want to kill his wife. The idea that somebody would just out of the blue want to kill somebody out of our family is just it's obscene. And as for the emails alleging she was having an affair. Did you guys discuss that? We did. She, she did not have an affair. What cops didn't tell Stephen initially is that they no longer believed his wife committed suicide. What do you think happened to Amy? I don't know. It looked to me like she shot herself. Not much did. Stephen claims the day his wife died, she hadn't been feeling well. He says it got so bad, her father came to pick up their son so he could take Amy to urgent care. But she decided not to go. Every time I'd ask her if she was okay, she'd say yes. Shortly after 5 o'clock, he checked on her one last time before heading out to pick up their son. You know, I poked my head and she was kneeling next to the bed at that point, um, which <clears throat> the position she's normally in when she's praying. So I figured she was busy. I, I said, you know, I'm going to go pick up. Stephen says he left around 5.30, and when he returned 90 minutes later, Amy was dead. I saw her on the floor, so blood, so don't, don't come out, I said, mommy's dead. Towards the end of the interview, cops drop a little truth bomb on Stephen. Investigators found blood throughout his house using luminol, blood that someone had obviously tried to clean up. Well, I could see that it looked like to be some blood in on the wood floor uh, just outside the bedroom that had been cleaned. Do you have any information about that? No. Detectives even offer possible explanations for how the blood may have gotten there. Were there any injuries by anyone in the house that may have been bleeding? Not that I know of. When you checked on Amy, do you recall getting blood on you in any way? I don't know. Really but in addition to the cleaned up pool of blood in the hallway, Luminol also revealed bloody footprints throughout the house. Stephen's shoe size is what? 12. He's a 12. And the bare feet on the floor, the one that was illuminated, was what size? Approximately, it was measured to be around a 12 as well. Again, detectives try to help Stephen come up with an explanation for this seemingly incriminating evidence. Do you recall if your socks uh, had any blood on them? Uh, any visual memory of that? I don't recall. It doesn't seem at this point that an intruder would be taking his or her shoes off and walking around a house. Well, not just that, but uh, uh, coming into the house, taking, taking their shoes off, locating the homeowner's gun, and shooting and killing Amy Allwine, and then cleaning up afterwards. Even though all three doors to the Allwine's home are monitored 24 hours a day with surveillance cameras, Stephen did have an explanation for how an intruder might have gotten inside undetected. There are only two that are recorded, so a couple of reasons for that. One is it's an extra fee each month to record them. Can we figure with the one in the back with the dogs moving around all back there, uh, we'd be sending out a bunch of useless information. Not only did the camera on the sliding glass door not record, Stephen said the door didn't lock properly. It seems that if you were in fear for your life, you would, number one, get the door fixed, and number two, make sure that that area is covered well. We thought so. But aside from the entry points, cleaned up blood and bloody footprints, the lack of blood elsewhere also raised suspicions. There wasn't any on the comforter on the bed, which to me says that the comforter was changed, that the one that was on the bed when she was killed there was not the one that we were looking at when, once we got there. Do you think it's possible the killer burned a lot of the evidence? That's, that's our theory, yes. 
That's because despite it being an unseasonably warm November day, cops found a big fire burning in the stove that heats the Allwines home. It's such a hot temperature, it would get rid of anything. Before wrapping up, cops had one very important question for Stephen. You haven't had a relationship with anyone, have you? No. During the marriage. The preacher who counsels couples at his church was about to make a bombshell admission. One he'd never told anyone. A couple of years ago, I had a short point in And it wasn't even aware of that? No, she was Okay. Uh, nobody was. The preacher confesses to having an affair with a woman he met online named Michelle. Did you share that with the FBI when they were doing these threat evaluations? Um, no. He says it was brief, but couldn't remember exactly when it began or when it ended. It's a little crass, but I don't remember it yesterday when we had sex the first time. No, I understand. I wouldn't expect you to do it. I'm sorry. Besides Michelle, uh, have there been any other romantic relationships mm -hmm. dating back 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's been the one infidelity uh, in the two decades of marriage. Mm -hmm. Cops question if Stephen's ex-lover, perhaps, wanted his wife out of the picture. In your estimation, does uh, Michelle have the capacity to have any involvement in what happened Sunday? Detectives were done asking questions, but their investigation of Stephen Allwine was just starting. I know that the FBI already looked at the two personal computers upstairs. Today, you don't have any objection to us looking into that. No. In the days following the murder of Amy Allwine, cops in Cottage Grove, Minnesota, quickly realized they don't need to look far to find a suspect. As evidence started coming in, there was a lot of information that we found out about Steve that started to focus our attention strictly at Steve. Ironically, much of that evidence was found on the IT specialist's own computers. You seized more than 60 pieces of electronics. Yep. Multiple cell phones, computers, hard drives, thumb drives, all sorts of electronic. Prosecutor Fred Fink says Stephen Allwine lied to cops during his interrogation when he said he only had one affair. Remember this? A couple of years ago, I had a short appointment with somebody. Uh, have there been any romantic relationships? No. You found at least three other affairs. Yes. Despite the pastor's role as a couple's counselor at his church, prosecutors say Stephen Allwine spent lots of time searching for women online and not just on any ordinary dating website. Stephen Allwine went on a website called Ashley Madison and he began communicating with women. This continued throughout the time that Amy Allwine was in fact killed. Ashley Madison is designed specifically for married people looking to have an affair. Detectives say Stephen had affairs with at least two women he met on the site. Did he meet them on multiple occasions? The one female, the, yes, he had a significant relationship with her over the course of many months. Um, they took trips together. They also found a woman Stephen met on Backpage.com who he paid for sex. Was it alarming to you when you found out this man of God, this Christian marriage counselor, was having so many affairs? It certainly speaks to his character, I think. And possibly that speaks to a little motivation as well for the murder. Stephen himself told cops his church doesn't condone divorce. We believe that, that marriage is a covenant not just between the man and the woman, but with God as well. And so, unless you know anything, break that covenant, then we don't, we don't divorce. Instead of divorce, Sergeant Randy McAllister believes Stephen chose murder as a way out of their marriage. I think it's safe to say he was nationally known within the denomination, maybe internationally known. So he was kind of a big deal in the church too. And we kind of think that maybe he didn't want to lose that standing because that was really important to him. Cops were quickly closing in on Stephen Albine when they suddenly stumbled upon their biggest break in the case yet. The Bitcoin wallet address that, that was found in December was key. 
Prosecutors say a 34-digit code found on Stephen Allwine's computer matches a Bitcoin code and proves that he is Dog Day Gone, the person who tried to hire a hitman on the dark web to kill Amy Allwine. A computer forensics expert says the code was first typed in the Notes app on Stephen's iPhone. 20 seconds after that note was created on Stephen Allwine's password protected iPhone. It was posted by Dog Day God on the Basa Mafia website. The message said, help, I posted the wrong Bitcoin code. This is the one that I meant to use. Less than a minute later, the code was deleted from Stephen's iPhone, but it was too late. It had already been uploaded to his computer through the cloud. Apparently, when you sync uh, iTunes between your computer and your phone, the cloud just sucks everything out of your phone. What Stephen should have known as an IT specialist. Delete does not always mean delete. Investigators soon find evidence they say proves Stephen was also behind the emails to his wife, demanding she commit suicide. The day before Amy got the first email from so-called Jane threatening her, the defendant had been on his computer and had accessed uh, Roderas.com and received the various addresses of uh, Amy's relatives. The addresses not only appear in the email, the sender even admits to using the Roderis website to find them. You think he had any idea that you were finding all of this against him? I don't think so. I think Stevens thinks he's smarter than most people. Detectives then discover what they believe was the first attempt to kill Amy Allwine that day, one that nearly went unnoticed. We had found an internet posting just doing an open source search from this dog day god looking for a drug called scopalamine. Detective Landkamer says when taken in large doses, the drug causes a person to hallucinate and become disoriented. Down in Colombia, it's pretty prevalent as a date rape drug. A test for the drug in Amy's system turned up an obscene amount. It was about 45 times the normal. 45 level. times the normal? Yeah, somewhere around there based on her blood levels, and they found uh, huge amounts of scopalmine in her stomach. Detectives allege Stephen put the drug in his wife's lunch the day she was murdered. Which would explain uh, the symptoms she was experiencing because those symptoms match scopalamine uh, poisoning. Detective Landkamer believes Stephen was hoping the drug would kill his wife. And if she would have died of poisoning, that would have been the way out? I think so. Mm -hmm. it, it's such an obscure drug that it's not normal to, to test for that. When the poisoning didn't work, cops allege he shot her in the head instead, staging the scene as a suicide and allowing his son to find his mom's body. What kind of father allows something like this to happen? It's certainly the question that all of us ask. It's a disgusting move. It really is. Two months after his wife's murder, Stephen Allwine was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Where was he arrested? We waited till he dropped his son off at school and we conducted a traffic stop. And do you think he was surprised? He didn't show it. Stephen made bail and returned home. His neighbors were terrified. And the police kept telling me, you don't have to worry about anything. He's not going to go after anybody. He just hated his wife. Two months later, Stephen Allwine was back behind bars after being indicted on one count of first degree premeditated murder. He remained there until his trial in January. Kevin DeVore was Stephen's attorney. Were you confident going into this trial? I was confident, but I've tried enough cases to know that I had some, some obstacles. His biggest obstacle was the Bitcoin code found on Stephen Allwine's computer, the same code that was used to hire a hitman to kill Amy. How did you explain that? Well, there was evidence that the Allwine's uh, computer system had been compromised. Uh, I would say hacked would be the right word for it. Kevin DeVore argued there was no physical proof that Stephen himself actually typed that code into his iPhone. It's all proof by way of computer records. And so it was the opinion of the forensic scientists that as their expert testified in the trial, any phone could be labeled S. Allwine iPhone. 
but jurors didn't buy the explanation. After just eight hours of deliberations, they found Stephen Allwine guilty of murdering his wife. What's one of the biggest mistakes Stephen made in all of this? He thought with his internet knowledge and his smarts that um, he was covering all his tracks. He, he, he didn't. Two days after the verdict was handed down, Stephen was sentenced to life in prison and addressed the court for the first time. There was no remorse for his actions. He stated that he loved his wife. He also said his wife's killer is still out there. You do not believe an unknown intruder entered that house and killed Amy. Not as much as a green Martian came down from Saturn and did it. Absolutely not. A family life shattered. Before being led away in handcuffs, the preacher turned convicted killer promised to continue spreading his faith. He said that he has changed lives while being held at our local jail and that as he was processed into prison, he would be bringing his Bible and continuing his ministry.